Yeah. Nech maiski in inaimo. Auna chinak mane shaat wit. Ko konek ana khpani wam shtaman wit. Ana kwalak na pinakiam naitana na mi tamna. Kanam tan khwet ki nak bnita ilwit. Na mi twanatash. Ach tanan wit wit wanatash. On this beautiful day, my relatives, Wanakshash <clears> Chaikwach, <throat> it's my name. My English name is Jode Gaudi, and I serve as the chairman of the Yakima Nation Tribal Council. <clears throat> and I wish to speak on this day here with a little bit of the history, as I believe today is an appropriate day to speak of historical perspectives. But I want to start with our people, our way of life. <clears throat> we, as the Tanan, the Nutitite, the native people of this land, <clears throat> throughout time with regard to the creation and the creation stories that our people carry this day, there's been a communication. That communication has come from Nami Anatla, Tamanmatla, our creator. And amongst that communication, there have been instructions about how we are to conduct ourselves as we walk upon this ground. Something that I wish to express <clears throat> is a representation that my elders have put inside of me to try my best to understand and carry. And it is a teaching of a natural cycle that goes with the natural law involving trush. And it starts with Walla Walla. And then it will go to Chush Pine. And then it goes to Wana Pine. And then it goes to Atta Chush Pine. And then Tooth. You see, Walla Walla is a spring or a brook where the purity of that chush, that water, flows from that. And as it flows down throughout, it'll eventually reach chush pine, that of a creek. And then the representation of that creek, it continues to flow into one of pine are in Chihuahua, a big river. And as that water flows through that big river, it eventually will reach Atta Chush Pine. That is the vastness of the ocean. And there is a beautiful thing that happens as these bodies of water are pulled up into the sky, formulating the clouds that we see. And as those clouds journey forward over the Ticham, the ground, Tuth, the rain. And as that rain comes down to feed this ground, it then becomes within the ground to start the cycle over again. The representation of the Walla Walla we, as the native people of this land, the Walla Walla is a representation to the babies, the little babies, because of the pureness associated with the child as they come into this world. So that spring is the representation of the purity of that water as it flows through that natural cycle. And then the baby grows into a younger person, a teenager, this is the flowing to the chush pine, the crick. And as that young person goes through the growth of a, a young one, they come across the barriers, much as are in a, exist within the crick, the rocks, the trees, the trout, the pennywinkle, all the different things that you see associated with the growth of a young person 
And as they strive to come through that growth, eventually to reach one a pine, that of an adult man or woman, and they take the representation of the life experience from child, baby, to a young person, to a man or a woman. And if they have the prayers and the strengths and the blessings of their people, their ancestors, perhaps they become the representation of what I see sitting before me. Atta Chush Pine, the elders. Atta Chush Pine, through the life experience of a baby to a young person, to a man or a woman, then growing into that elder. And the life experiences from baby to elder, they have a special gift that we see. And that gift is the ability for tooth. They bring forth the knowledge of their life representation. And much as the bodies of water through Atta Chush Pine, the ocean gathers that purity into the clouds and it rains down back upon this ground. These elders here, they do the same for us. They do the same. They take the purity of the natural cycle of life and they rain it down upon us, younger ones. And I express this as one representation to the followings of our way of life because it cannot be debated amongst us and it is not up for question, nor is it up for interpretation with regard to the source of these types of teachings that come with our way of life. They are what society has come to acknowledge as divine. It is unquestionable. And so with that, I will share that much as I transition to another historical perspective. And that historical perspective is a, a will that had historically come forth. And the representation of what we see behind us here, it almost looks like a lake. What had happened historically to a time period where these elders who sit before me saw once a free flowing river and now you see what represents behind us. Where did the will originate from specific to changing the atmosphere, the landscape, the bodies of water, the ground associated with this that us Nati Tait, the native people have known since time immemorial. And in just about 164 years since the treaty of the Yakama Nation in the United States was signed, there have been significant changes. And I, as a person who's tasked, along with my fellow leaders, searching out in discussion with our elders, our people, trying to come to an understanding of how our way of life of the natives is fading and what we can collectively do about sustaining our way of life from now until as far as we can see into the future. Because if we do not, then we will cease to be. There's another word that's referenced with regard to that. It's called genocide. So I'm going to express some history on this day formerly known as Columbus Day. What has been adopted by many as Indigenous Peoples Day. And when you go back through history, we're going to talk a little bit here, and I ask for your patience, because we're going to all engage in a history lesson together. In 1492, the Catholic Majesties, King Ferdinand and Queen Isabel, issued their privileges and prerogatives to Christopher Columbus, Cristobal Colon, directing him by their command to discover and subdue or otherwise dominate some islands and continent in the ocean with the hope 
that by God's assistance, some of these said islands and continent and the ocean will be discovered and conquered or otherwise dominated by your means and conduct, while adding the claim that his conduct in discovering and subduing or dominating was just and reasonable. 1492. 1493, in interaction with the Roman Catholic Church through the former Pope Alexander VI on May 3rd in 1493 issued a papal decree to Queen Isabel and King Ferdinand confirming to the monarchs the remote and unknown mainlands and islands lying towards the western parts of the ocean sea that have been discovered are hereafter may be discovered by you and your envoys and with them all their lordships, cities, castles, places, villages, rights, and jurisdictions provided however these countries have not been in the actual temporal domination of any Christian lords. This is often referenced as the Papables. The Papables <clears throat> by writ of holy marching orders from the former popes who sat in the 15th and 16th century, leading to 1496, because <clears throat> England had to counter the actions of Spain. King Henry VII issued, later, issued letters patent to John Cabot and his sons, purporting to authorize to Cabot full free and authority, leave and power to sail all parts and to seek out, discover, find whatever isles, countries, regions, or provinces of the heathen and infidels, whatever so they may be, and in what part of the world soever they be, which before this time have been unknown to all Christians. We have granted them, and also to every of them, the heirs of them, and ever of them, and their deputies, and have given them license to set up our banners, our ensigns in every village, town, castle, isle, our mainland of them newly found, and that the aforesaid John and his sons may subjugate or dominate, occupy and possess all such towns, cities, castles, and isles of them found, which they can subjugate, dominate, occupy and possess as our vassals and lieutenants getting unto this rule, title, and jurisdiction of the same villages, towns, castles, and firm land so found. History is history, but we're now we're discussing the justification of so-called discovery. The papal edicts were issued to various monarchies, Spain, England, Portugal, <clears throat> and throughout the time period, it was by the essence of a issuance of holy right that these monarchies had come to lay claim to lands that they deemed to be discovered. Because if they were not occupied by Christian peoples and our nations, they deemed the inhabitants of such places to be heathens and infidels, beasts that should be subjugated, along with all land, water, and everything that resides within their territories and areas. So that's an interesting thing because it led to 1775. And this was based upon the tradition demonstrated by the privileges and prerogatives to Christopher Columbus and the Vatican papal decrees of domination of the 15th century from 1452 to 1493. Bruno de Hesita, a Spanish explorer, became the first documented Christian European to sight via ship <clears throat> what he thought may have been the mouth of the Enchuana formerly known as the Columbia River, and the traditional territories of the barbarous, as they deemed us, the original inhabitants of this land, heathens and infidels that occupied such territory. This is strictly from the wording of the Papal Bulls of 1493, the native nations they were referring to that were situated in this territory. It later led to another time, 1783, at the end of the American Revolution, the American diplomatic envoys <clears throat> signed the Treaty of Paris. Britain yields to the 13 United States their claims to the old Northwest Territory, a region encompassing <clears throat> the geographical area west of Pennsylvania, northwest of the Ohio River, 
and east of the Mississippi River below the Great Lakes. Significant time by which movement of occupation, discovery, dictation, domination, and dehumanization becoming the result, leading to 1787, the Continental Congress of the United 13 States passed an ordinance for the government of the territory of the United States. Northwest of the River Ohio, a framework intended to form the first colony of the American Empire and to extend the domination that empire westward by forming five new states, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, and Wisconsin. By colonizing the lands and rivers located within the territories of the original native nations of that vast geographical area. This leads to 1789, another date of significance. The U.S. Constitution becomes ratified in the previous year. It became effective, formally creating the political system of the United States. Also, in that year, in the very first statute, in the first session of Congress convened on the, under the newly adopted Constitution, they reaffirmed the 1787 Northwest Ordinance making that document the means by which the United States would begin to colonize the lands of the native nations in the West. The Northwest Ordinance set the precedent by which the federal government would assert claim of a right of domination or sovereignty. Westward, new territories would be formed and the states would be created and admitted into the Union rather than expanding the existing states. Lands acquired from native nations would be characterized as public lands until allocated to states or private parties. The act also implied and proclaimed a right of U.S. domination over navig navigable waters by noting that such waters <coughs> would become common highways for all U.S. citizens. Finally, the Northwest Ordinance stated, the utmost good faith shall always be observed toward the Indians, their lands and property shall never be taken from them without their consent. And in their property, rights, and liberty, they shall never be invaded or disturbed. Unless in just and lawful wars authorized by Congress, but laws founded in justice and humanity shall from time to time be made for the preventing of wrongs being done to them and for preserving peace and friendship with them. This leads to a time period specifically to the Enchiwana. You ever wonder who the first person that laid claim to the Enchiwana from a European standpoint perspective was? And as history will tell us in 1792, a U.S. merchant by the name of Robert Gray became the so-called first American to sail the Columbia River. Gray named the river after his ship, Columbia Rita Viva, and symbolically claimed the North River Bank on behalf of the U.S. How did he do that? The story goes as such. Spain erred in the fact that they believed that there was a river, but they didn't go up and explore it. Britain took the word of Spain and continued north, bypassing what they believed to perhaps be a river. Captain Gray found the river, navigated away through the channels of the sandbars, and began to sail upriver, where he eventually ran ashore. He had to dig himself out, and they turned around and began to go downriver. The day after they dug themselves out, they dropped anchor. Him and his first mate went to the north shore of the Enchuana, the Columbia River. They planted the American flag. They took some coins and they buried them under a pine tree. And they asserted dominion, claim of the Columbia River, the Enchuana. That is how discovery of this body of water that is behind us was asserted in the year of 1792. In 1803, the U.S. and France agreed to the Louisiana Purchase, whereby the U.S. obtained by treaty from France its claim to approximately 827,000 acres 
of land between the Missouri River and the Rocky Mountains. The purpose of the Louisiana Purchase or the Louisiana Treaty was to improve U.S. profits from fur trade. The entire area from the Rocky Mountains to the Pacific Ocean was regarded as parts unknown. The most that France had ceded to the United States was a claim, a claim to the lands of the native nations that the U.S. might locate in the future. Because France asserted dominion or exerted title of the area deemed as the Louisiana Purchase also from the historical papal bulls issued in 1493 and other dates. In 1803, U.S. explorers Meriwether Lewis <clears throat> and William Clark received assignment from President Jefferson to begin preparations for a cross-country expedition. The president's principal order to the explorers was to locate <clears throat> a direct river route to the Pacific Ocean that, be, could, that could be used for commerce. However, the president the president also instructed the explorers to learn about the native nations along their route, as this reconnaissance would facilitate the U.S.'s claim of a right of domination, sovereignty, over the forced assimilation of the original native nations of the area. 1805, Lewis and Clark reached the mouth of the Columbia River and established Fort Clatsop on its south side. 1811, the Pacific Fur Company, led by John Jacob Astor, established Fort Astoria in modern-day Astoria, Oregon, the first permanent American settlement established on the Pacific coast. In 1818, the U.S. and Britain entered into the Treaty of 1818 to resolve the outstanding boundary disputes between the two countries. Article 3 of the treaty provides that both countries would jointly control the Oregon country for 10 years. In 1823, the judicial branch of the United States, <clears throat> the United States Supreme Court, adopted the doctrine of Christian discovery and domination in the case called Johnson Lessee versus McIntosh, 21 U.S. 543 in the year of 1823, stating that the first Christian people to locate lands inhabited by natives who were heathens had asserted the ultimate domination a right of domination over and to the soil <clears throat> to be in themselves. These are quotes that come specifically out of that case. How is it that the United States Supreme Court issued a false religious pretense for the justification to develop title of property? Because Johnson Lessee versus McIntosh in 1823 is the foundation of federal Indian law. It is the origin of federal Indian law. It is also the origin of property law, or the assertion of title, so-called legal title or property. Its foundations utilized as a justification to the United States Supreme Court asserted the papables, quoting the papables of 1493 and others in its justification to do so. In 1824, the United States Supreme Court issued a decision in Gibbons versus Ogden 22 U.S. 1, which relied upon the Commerce Clause of the United States Constitution to justify the federal government's regulatory authority over nav navigable waters throughout the United States. In 1827, the U.S. and Britain's joint occupancy of the Oregon country under the Treaty of 1818 is renewed on a year-to-year -year basis. In 1838, U.S. Senator Lewis Lynn Robert in discussing the U.S.'s claim to the Oregon country before the U.S. Senate, cites Captain Gray's voyage up the Columbia River and Lewis and Clark's expedition as important circumstances in United States title. That was notice to the world of claim, and that Lewis and Clark's solemn act of possession was followed up by settlement and occupation made by John Jacob Astor in the foundation of Fort Astoria. In 1843, settlers in Oregon country established a provisional government which continued to function until the United States' formal establishment of the Oregon Territory. In 1845, the term Manifest Destiny was used for the first time to describe the U.S.'s perceived right to the imperial expansion. The term was used by a journalist in reference to the U.S.'s annexation of Texas. 
but was soon after applied to the U.S.-British dispute over the right of domination for Oregon Territory. In 1846, the U.S. and Britain entered into the Oregon Treaty, which formally divided the claim of a right of domination over the Oregon country between the two countries at the 49th parallel. In 1848, the U.S. claimed portion of the Oregon country is formally organized as the colonial territory of the American Empire, the Oregon Territory, through the act to establish the territorial government of Oregon on August 14th of 1848. This act <clears throat> states that the rights of the native nations in the new territory would be unaffected so long as their rights remained unextinguished by treaty. Moreover, the U.S. claims the dominating authority to make regulations concerning the tribes are to their lands, property, or rights. The act in a provision arguably premised on the 1787 Northwest Ordinance pledge of the utmost good faith towards the Indians and their protection of their property, their rights, and their liberty. Also states that rivers and streams where salmon are found could not be obstructed by dams or other impediments. Finally, the act asserted that all territorial laws affecting title to land would be null and void, as the U.S. perceived itself to have absolute power and title over the new territory. In 1851, in a Kentucky case focused on the issue of slavery, the U.S. Supreme Court upheld the constitutionality of the Northwest Ordinance of 1787, but concluded that most provisions of the law ceased to apply once the relevant lands became states. The court did, however, mention provisions of the ordinance as are yet in force, which presumably includes the utmost good faith provision of the ordinance towards the Indians. This was in the case Strader versus Graham in 1851. In 1853, the Oregon Territory is formally divided into two sections, the Oregon Territory and the Washington Territory. The Oregon ter <clears throat> through the act to establish the territorial government of Washington on March 2nd of 1853, this act stated that the U.S.'s claim of dominating authority to make regulations concerning the tribes and are their lands, property, or rights, whether by treaty, law, or otherwise, would be unaffected. The act also purported to grant concurrent jurisdiction to both the Oregon Territory and the Washington Territory over offenses committed on the Columbia River. In 1855, under a coercive threat of bloodshed issued by Governor Isaac Stevens, the Confederated Tribes and Bands of the Yakama Nation entered into the treaty with the U.S., treaty with the Yakimas, Yakima Nation in the United States, in which the Yakima Nation is said to have formally ceded certain rights to approximately 10 million acres of lands to the U.S., while reserving more than 1 million acres for its exclusive use and benefit, among other reserved rights. 1859, Oregon formally is admitted into the Union under the Act for the Admission of Oregon into the Union on February 14, 1859. The Act stated that the new state would have jurisdiction over seminal and criminal matters on the Columbia River concurrent with the Washington Territory. Furthermore, the Columbia River and all navigable waters would be common highways to Oregon and the U.S. citizens. Finally, Oregon's admission to the U.S. was conditioned on Oregon's irrevocable acknowledgement that it would never interfere with the primary disposal of the soil, exertion of title, dominion, by the U.S. or with any regulations Congress may pass in relation to title. In 1866, the U.S. issued the Supreme Court decision Gilman versus Philadelphia which affirmed the holding, holding in the Ogden case that Congress has regulatory authority over navig navig navigable waterways throughout the United States. In 1886, the United States Supreme Court in United States versus Kagama, 118 U.S. 375, that Congress has on the basis of U.S. claim of a right of domination consistent with the doctrine of Christian discovery and domination a claim of an extra-constitutional plenary power over all Indian affairs. The plenary power doctrine on the extra constitutional basis of which Congress claims the right to impose its dominating will on native nations through congressional acts. That's an important, very important date.
What it says is what Congress says goes. That's how you get to renegotiate treaties. And that's what's happened throughout time. <clears throat> In 1889, Washington formally became a U.S. state through the act to provide for the division of Dakota in two states and to enable the people of North Dakota, South Dakota, Montana, and Washington to form constitutions and state governments and to be admitted into the union on an equal footing with the original states and to make donations of public lands to such states. On February 22, 1889, the act noted that citizens of the new states disclaimed all right and title to the unappropriated public lands and lands owned held and held by Indians and until title to Indian lands has been extinguished by the United States, those lands would be subject to the disposition of the United States and remain under the absolute jurisdiction and control, meaning under the domination of the United States Congress. In 1896, Congress passed the Right-of-Way Act, in eight, which authorized the Secretary of Interior to pr <coughs> pr permit private citizens to acquire, acquire rights-of-way for economic development purposes including power generation and transmission across public lands that were not within national parks, Indian reservations, military reservations, or national forests. In 1899, Congress passed a Rivers and Harbors Act that assumed federal authority over all navig navigable waterways and requires anyone seeking to dam a nav navigable waterway to first obtain approval from the Army Corps of Engineers. In 1901, Congress affirmed the Rights-of-Way Act, which authorized the Secretary of Interior to permit private citizens to acquire, acquire rights-of-way across certain federal lands, including Indian reservations, for economic development purposes, including electrical power generation and transmission. In 1902, Congress passed the Reclamation Act, directing the Secretary of Interior to build irrigation works for the storage, diversion, and development of waters. Under this act, the Secretary of Interior created the United States Reclamation Service, which would become the Bureau of Reclamation in 1907. In 1903, the United States Supreme Court held in Lone Wolf versus Hitchcock that pursuant to the claim of plenary power, Congress possesses the authority to abrogate treaties with Native nations. It does not say that in the Treaty of 1855 between the Yakama Nation and the United States. In 1906, Congress passed the General Dams Act, which authorized the federal government to license private dams on navigable waterways and provide general rules for the construction of hydropower dams. In 1907, President Roosevelt created, created the Indian Inland Waterways Commission to provide recommendations for improving the navigability of waterways. The commission ultimately recommended using hydropower dams to both improve navigability and provide a funding source for maintaining navig navigable waterways. In 1920, Congress passed the Federal Water Power Act to create the Federal Power Commission, which was charged with reviewing private requests to develop waterways. This act is seen as the final act solidifying <clears throat> the federal government's seizure of control over hydropower and development from the states. In 1925, Congress authorized the Army Corps of Engineers and the Federal Power Commission to issue a report evaluating the Columbia River Basin for hydropower development. In 1926, the Army Corps of Engineers and the Federal Power Commission issued a report the 308 report, recommending eight dams along the Columbia River, including the Bonneville Dam. In 1929, construction began on the Rock Island Dam, which was the first dam on the main stem of the Columbia River. Construction was completed in 1933. In 1932, the prior recommendation for a dam at Bonneville is reiterated in the House Document 103, which issues thousands of pages detailing opportunities for hydropower and navigability development of the Columbia River. In 1933, the Army Corps of Engineers began construction of the Bonneville Dam at the direction of Franklin D. Roosevelt, the president who sat at that time, under the National Industrial Recovery Act, which authorized President Roosevelt to complete public works projects. 
In 1935, the United States Supreme Court found <clears throat> that the National Industrial Recovery Act to be unconstitutional, an unconstitutional delegation of legislative power to the president. This was in the case <clears throat> Schulter Poultry Company versus United States. And then Congress then authorized the dam construction to remove any concern about the president's unconstitutional authorization for the dam. In 1937, Congress passed the Bonneville Project Act to authorize the completion of the construction of the Bonneville Dam. The act also created the Bonneville Power Administration under the Department of Interior to sell hydropower generated energy to local utilities. In 1938, the Bonneville Dam construction was completed. In 1945, Congress passed the Rivers and Harbors Act that authorized the construction of the McNary Dam, which was being lobbied by the Open River Navigation Association, the Umatilla Rapids Association, and the Umatilla Watershed Association. In 1945, the Army Corps of Engineers sent a colonel to meet with the Yakima Nation to discuss the future construction of the Dalles Dam. The talks broke down over the Yakima Nation's interest in protecting the usual and accustomed UNA sites specifically at Celilo Falls. There was also significant conflict between the Yakima Nation, Umatilla Warm Springs and Nez Perce with regard to the historical right of who had occupied this territory. 1947, the construction of McNary Dam was started. In 1948, a flood wiped out Vanport, Oregon and with it, any public opposition to the construction of the Dalles Dam. In 1950, Congress passed the Rivers and Harbors Act that authorized the construction of the Dalles Dam and the John Day Dam. In 1951, the Yakima Nation Tribal Council passed a resolution <coughs> speaking to the opposition of Umatilla, Warm Springs, and Nez Perce on settlement discussions concerning Slilo Falls. <coughs> the Army Corps of Engineers did not honor and eventually settled or had discussions with all. In 1952, the Army Corps of Engineers began construction on the Dalles Dam and also starts to negotiate in earnest with the Yakima Nation over the loss of fishing sites upstream of the Dalles Dam. In 1953, Congress appropriated funds for the Department of the Army to settle claims with the Yakima Nation related to the loss of fishing sites resulting from the Dalles Dam construction. 67 Stat 197. In 1954, the Yakima Nation and the United States entered into the Dalles Dam Settlement. <clears throat> the Yakima Nation was provided funds for the destruction of the nation's usual and accustomed fishing grounds. In 1954, the construction of McNary Dam was completed. In 1957, construction of the Dalles Dam was completed. In 1968, Construction of the John Day was started, and in 1972, construction of John Day Dam was completed. So here's the question of today's day. What legal basis, what legal basis did the United States have to dam the Columbia River, the Anchuana, and to impair the Yakima Nation's treaty reserved fish, fishing rights at all usual and accustomed places without first obtaining Yakima Nation's free prior and informed consent. Under what basis did that happen? Well, if we were all paying attention together, you could trace the original justification of that decision back to an assertion of claim, of title, of property, which was based upon the act of the putting of the American flag and the placement of coins under a pine tree. What, we would, what would we do collectively, regardless whether you're from the native nations of this territory, regardless of your background, no matter what race, creed, origin, religious belief and our following. What would we collectively do about the understanding of what the truth is of history? The truth. 
because these actions of the assertion of so-called original claim, title, domination, have never been repudiated. They still govern today. They still rule today. How do they rule today? Because whether it's the Yakima Nation, Warm Springs Nation, Umatilla Nation, Nez Perce Nation, Lummi Nation, or any Native Nation for that matter, if we take exception to the history and how that history has materialized something that we disagree with, we are forced into a form of dispute resolution. That form of dispute resolution is federal court. We are forced there. And under the manner of how procedure happens within that dispute resolution forum, the, jur <coughs> the uh, judicial system of the United States, you have to remember that in 1823, the foundation of federal Indian law is based upon a false religious pretense. More often than not, Native nations are entering a form of dispute resolution where a lineage of case law can be traced back to Johnson Lessee versus McIntosh. Yakima Nation, as well as other Native nations, through its strength in asserting a commitment to the original promises memorialized in the Treaty of 1855 have been able to overcome that at times. And there's times that we have not been able to overcome that. Because of this history, because of the detriment of our way of life as the Tanun, the Nutitite, the native people of this land, because of the original assertion of the justification of a false religious pretense to be asserted as the will that has shifted that the native people's way of life has faded and something else has been developed. Today, the Yakima Nation with its allies are calling upon the United States for the removal of Dalles Dam, for the removal of Bonneville Dam, for the removal of John Day Dam. We are calling upon that action to happen. Because when you go back and you understand the truth, the truth with regard to what has materialized this lake behind us all, once one of the greatest and free flowing, mightiest, one of pine big rivers in this world. These dams materialized as was expressed here through the various points and times of assertion to dominion, domination, based upon historical documents that have nothing to do with the original free nations of these territories. And through that assertion of title, of dominion over all lands, waters, and people who inhabited such which they deemed to be infidels, We're not infidels, nor are we savages. The origin of the Nutitite and the Tanun is as beautiful, unique, strong, and divine as the origin of any peoples in any parts of this world. Nami Anathla Tamanwathla was the one who had brought forth the representation of the native people of this land. So once again, as we look into the future, and as my elders will express to me the representations of the substantial changes that have happened from their childhood to the day that they sit here today, the real question will be, what does the future hold? And I will say this, that I've come to the determination that the future holds one of two things specific to this discussion. We have a choice, and it's one or the other. Dams are salmon. The Nutitite, the native people of this land, will be fighting for the Waikanish, for the salmon, for the water. 
So this is what we've gathered here on this day, formerly known as Columbus Day, to speak about the truth of history. And oftentimes the representation will be expressed that the truth will set us all free. This is not made up history. Every one of us now has an obligation, regardless of your background, regardless of your capacity in which you conduct yourself on a day-to-day -day basis, <coughs> regardless of whether you reside in this territory. If you're a leader, if you're a politician, if you're a person who's advocating in the realm of science, if you're a person who's a U.S. citizen, if you're a person who's advocating under the principles of the U.S. Constitution and the principles that we should all be standing for, living for, righteousness, integrity, equality, justice for all, these are the principles that will be highlighted by this truth, the representation of the awareness of this truth historically must be shared by all. And every one of us will be given the opportunity to make cho choices based upon the understanding of that truth. And the prayer will be that the principles of integrity, the princi principles of patience, of righteousness, of love, of compassion, will shine brightly upon all those who are affected by the representation that has come forth today in the continued discussions and work that will happen into the future. We are giving all entities, jurisdictions, and individuals who represent such a chance to do the right thing. Why? Because we understand the truth of the history that has materialized this lake behind us all today. So with that, a collective prayer for all of us, because this isn't just for Native people. This is for everyone. This is for everyone of all backgrounds. Our future generations are relying upon that and the ancestors that we look to for guidance, the elders that we speak to today, they tell us that we're to look as far as we can into the future. Will we be the generation that forgot those who are coming behind us, those yet unborn? Will we be the generation that forgot to speak for the resources that cannot speak in a manner that we can understand? So today, on this beautiful day, we bring forth a will, and the representation of that will is for the removal of Dow's Dam, the removal of Bonneville Dam, and the removal of John Day Dam. These are no small things, someone may say, but if you look at the entire picture of what's at stake, they are very small things. Some of us in our realm may identify the representations of the beads and trinkets that were offered our ancestors, unbeknownst to them for the deception that was at hand. The significance of these acts, when you look at the larger picture, because the same historical justification that was utilized in the materialization of these dams, the doctrine of Christian discovery, okay, are also the same historical documents that resulted in the greatest genocidal acts in the known history of man. This is only one small piece of that history. So I call upon all those who come across this to pull that truth with inside of your heart, your mind, your body, your spirit, specifically to the brothers and sisters of the Christian faith there are thousands, hundreds of thousands, nearly on the brink of millions of Christians who know this history. They are advocating 
that these historical actions be undone. And so I want there to always be an understanding that through the love and the compassion asserted through our ancestors that we do our best to carry today, this is not an attack on Christianity. If you were to see it for its truthful perspective, it is actually standing for the principles of Christianity and standing against those who have utilized that faith to do very detrimental acts upon peoples across the world. So once again, I thank everyone for being here. And I wish to say, I have a love in my heart for this Enchuana. Been on this river since I was a child. I have a love in my heart for this land, for my elders who still live here, who still carry on and practice our way of life, for our ancestors, for our children, and for those who are coming behind, those yet unborn. With that, I say, Klau Kush, and thank you very much. There will be other speakers that will follow me. But I thank you for being here this day. Klau Kush.